I could help you, but I'd rather stand and record. Okay. Packs are on. Rock. We're ready to go. Jesus Christ. Get out of here now. Yeah, please. Okay, I've got everything on video, man. Come on, turn it off! Oh, well, you can't ah! get back in the creek either. Let's get out. Okay. Here we go. Let's get the shit come back on, up. Come on, Heather. Turn that thing off. Heather, come on. Let's go. Are you not scared enough? No, but why you? Put the camera down. This is not funny. You're going around doing your documentary thing, man. You're still doing... At the twilight flash. That tree is down. That's the same one. And I'm sorry to everyone. I was very naive. Josh. Josh, is that you down there? In October of 1994, three student filmmakers disappeared into the woods near Burkittsville, Maryland while shooting a documentary. A year later, their footage was found. So begins the iconic mythology that shocked audiences and influenced an entire subgenre of horror films. Hey guys, what's happening? Niad here with Film Comics Explained. And as requested, today we're exploring the Blair Witch Project. There are an unusually high number of children laid to rest here. Yet no one in the town seems to recall anything unusual about this time. Yet legend tells a different story. The infilm narrative states that Burkittsville, Maryland used to be called Blair back in the 18th century until one of its residents named Ellie Kedwood was tried for witchcraft in 1785. Responsible for a long string of deaths and unexplained disappearances since, she remains an imposing figure in the town's folklore, maintaining long periods of dormancy, only to re-emerge and bring about a reign of terror on those who enter her domain. She was uh, sitting down in the waters, blasting around like a child, a small child would do. Eleven witnesses saw a ghostly hand come up from the creek and drag this little girl underneath. With power stemming from witchcraft and the dark arts, she has the ability to manipulate and control her surroundings and change her appearance to suit whatever will frighten her victims most. In the book The Blair Witch Cult, she's described as a monstrous hag who levitates, while others have described her as an old woman dressed in all black or a naked elder covered in thick black hair. Several theories have been put forward to explain her motives. One is that Ellie has claimed the Black Hills as her home and is simply killing intruders. In the promotional prelude, Bill Barnes claims that the witch is actively creating her own mythology, periodically killing in order to keep her legend alive. And they come up to Coffin Rock. And then these men who are laid out side by side next to each other, which you could call in a ritualistic fashion. And there was a first search party dead on this rock while another theory suggests that she's sustained by human sacrifice. Regardless, her habit of stalking and tormenting her prey for days prior to killing them, often through extremely brutal methods, proves that she's a vengeful and unforgiving sadist not to be trifled with. Here he is, filling out our first slate for our first shot. Should we all, like, cut our fingers open and bleed on it? A little <laughs> bloodletting on the slate? No, we'll save that for later. In October of 1994, Heather, Mike, and Josh set out to produce a documentary about the fabled Blair Witch. Arriving in Burkittsville, Maryland, they interview residents and learn about the crimes of Ruston Parr, a hermit who lived in the woods that killed seven children in the 1940s, murdering them in pairs while having one stand in the corner, something that becomes relevant at the end. Finally, one day, old Mr. Parr come down into the market and said, I'm finally finished. They searched his house and they found the bodies of seven kids from the area. Later, some fishermen tell the story of Robin Weaver, a girl who went missing in 1888 and claimed that she was taken by an old woman whose feet never touched the ground. Robin Weaver, I believe her name right. was, wandered off, disappeared into the woods. Right. Three yeah. days later, she just uh, appears back on her grandmother's porch. Believing everyone to just be superstitious, they venture into the woods to explore locations linked to the mythology, including Coffin Rock, a site where five men were ritualistically murdered. They soon find an old cemetery with small cairns, which Josh accidentally disturbs, precipitating the sound of twigs snapping around them in the evenings. Slightly uncomfortable, they decide to hike back to the car, but are unable to find it before dark, forcing them to make camp. Jesus Christ, what the f is that? 
The disturbing sounds intensify, and in the morning, they're met by three cards that have been built around their tent, and the revelation that Heather's map is missing. Mike admits that he kicked it into a creek out of frustration, leading to a fight between the three, who soon realize they are lost and in serious trouble. They don't know the half of it. They decide to head south using Mike's compass, and discover figures suspended from trees around them. What? What kind of stuff? What? This is followed by more strange sounds that night, and something that shakes the tent, causing them to hide in the woods until dawn. Returning to their tent, they find their possessions have been rifled through, and Josh's equipment covered in slime. Coming to a river identical to one they crossed earlier, they then realize that they've been walking in a circle, adding to their nightmare. After another day of wandering the woods, they set up camp once again, but Josh isn't there when they wake up. at the river or something. If he was at the river, he could hear me from here. They hear his screams and go searching, but can't find him. Heather's fears are realized the next day when she discovers a bundle of sticks tied with fabric. Opening it, she finds a blood-soaked piece of his shirt containing teeth, hair, a finger, and a large piece of his tongue. And I just want to apologize to Mike's mom and Josh's mom and my mom, and I'm sorry to everyone. They hear Josh's agonized cries again, and throwing caution to the wind, follow them to an abandoned house containing demonic symbols and bloody handprints on the walls, as you do. Unfortunately, as they enter the basement, an unseen force attacks Mike. Heather then enters screaming, and a camera captures Mike standing in a corner before she herself is attacked. And when it was released in cinemas, it put the fear of God into an entire generation of moviegoers. It's a brilliant story, except of course none of it's true. Well, not all of it is true. The scariest movie of all time is a true story. This was the tagline used for the Blair Witch Project. Ed and I both, you know, try to do something different with a genre that we felt was kind of getting a little old. So we felt Blair was in that same spirit, something that was a psychological horror. The idea for the movie came while directors Daniel Merrick and Eduardo Sanchez were still attending college at the University of Central Florida. They found reality shows and documentaries about paranormal activity scarier than traditional horror flicks, and crafted a plan to create a found footage horror. Together, they and a few others started Hacks and Films, and got to work producing their movie. We came up with this, you know, real-time format to shoot, you know, the solid eight days out in the woods and, and keep the actors immersed in their characters as much as possible. Knowing that success would ultimately depend on the cast, they auditioned thousands of actors before finally landing on Heather Donahue, Michael C. Williams, and Joshua Leonard. We weren't told much as far as specifics of what we would be doing. I mean, even in the audition process, we've said, if you don't like camping, if you don't like being out in the woods, if you don't like being scared, don't even try out for this part. According to Heather, not much information was given about the film or their characters, just a short description about a completely improvised feature film to be shot in a wooded location. Sanchez and Merrick had written up a short 35-page script, but that was it, and the rest of the dialogue was going to be improvised by the actors. Their performance of being lost in the woods were amazingly realistic, because the poor guys were actually lost at least three times. The scene where their tent starts moving violently was also unscripted. The directors essentially ran out and began shaking their tent without warning, causing them to freak out. Montgomery College film students were reportedly shooting a school project about a local myth called the Blair Witch. At this time, their whereabouts are no still unknown. No discussion of this film is complete without mentioning that this film has one of the most intricate and successful marketing campaigns ever. In essence, it was advertised that the film was cut together from footage found of documentarians that died. Missing posters of the leads were then put up, and the IMDb page listed the actors as missing, presumably deceased, for the first year it was out. Uh, if, you, if you look into the history, apparently there have been other search groups in the past, and on some search groups nobody turned up missing, but on some search groups uh, there was foul play. The film in marketing was so convincing that Heather's mother received sympathy cards from people that believed that her daughter had died. The manufacturing of newspaper articles, fake police reports, and news footage makes it a truly compelling and intricate multimedia experience. He would never leave his family hanging like this. He had those that said, oh, it's a hoax. And even some of them blame me for being maybe part of the hoax. I don't believe in ghosts and vampires and communists. No. And it paid off, with the promotional website getting 160 million hits by that August. Which is amazing, considering the internet was in its infancy. It then became one of the most profitable indie films ever, earning $248 million against a budget of only 300000 
At last count, the film had taken nearly $150 million in outstripping the likes of Scream, which cost 100 times as much to make, and capturing the imagination of audiences who, a year ago, were laughing along with in-jokey teen terror picks. Supported by an amazing sound design and terrific improvisational skills from the main cast, the horror of three friends confronted with unimaginable malice is palpable. Following its release, there have been thousands of found footage low-budget horror movies emulating the Blair Witch Project, but none feel as real, innovative, or have left a legacy and impact on the genre quite like it did. But with that said, of course, I'd love to hear what you guys thought about the movie, so please share that in the comments below. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video, come join our regular streams on Twitch, and uh, yeah, if you have any other suggestions, feel free to leave them in the comments below. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film and Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by.